In this video, I'll talk about four famous and related argument forms. Modus ponens, modus tollens, affirming the consequent, and denying the antecedent. Hello, my name is Chico. Welcome to the Philosopher Channel, Introduction to Propositional Logic. In the last few videos, we've been talking about argument forms, and I said to go ahead and check out chapter 5.6, and then we would look at some famous argument forms, and I would get to them a little bit more depth than they go in the textbook. So, modus ponens, let's start with that. Modus ponens is a very famous argument form that looks something like this. If alpha, then beta, alpha, therefore beta. And I would say that it's the one that uh, makes the most sense out of the four, right? The one that's the most intuitive. You know, if you have the conditional, if alpha, then beta, then you're saying that if you have alpha, you gotta have beta. So then when we say, yeah, I have alpha, by the way, well, of course, you would conclude that you must have beta as well. An example of an instance of this form would be something like this. If you have water, then you have H2O. You have water, therefore you have H2O. So we'll say like if W, then H, W, therefore H. So let's look at, at the truth table of this argument form. And we have first that conditional if alpha, then beta. Uh, now remember that a conditional is only false when you have the uh, antecedent true and the consequent false. And that only happens in row two, otherwise it's true. So for rows one, three, and four, this conditional is gonna be true. Only in row two is it false. Looking at the rest of these uh, truth value assignments, remember that we have an invalid argument if and only if there's at least one line where we have all true premises and a false conclusion. So that's what we're gonna look for. Are there any lines, at, at least one line where we have something like that? If there isn't, since we've exhausted all the possible combinations of truth values, we can say, ah, this must be a valid argument. So I look at, at this truth table and I notice that uh, in rows two, three, and four, we have false premises, so I don't really care if I have a true or a false conclusion, right? It's not the case in any of those rows that we have true premises and a false conclusion. Um, so those don't count. And then when I look at row one, I see that both premises are true, but the conclusion is also true. So we never have it be the case where we have a line where all premises are true and the conclusion is false. This is a valid argument. And remember we said, not, not a valid argument. It's a valid star argument form. Now. Let me refresh your memory on what I mean by that. Again, the alpha and the beta there are not propositions themselves. They are well-formed formula variables, so they stand for propositions, but they're not propositions. And remember, what we learned about in the last video is that if an argument form is valid star, meaning that you know it's valid, so to speak, in this truth table, then uh, all the, in, the arguments that are instances of that argument form will also turn out to be valid arguments. So that's great. Any argument I make using this argument form I know is gonna be a valid argument. Now let's look at a related argument form affirming the consequent. So this is an argument form that looks something like this. If alpha then beta, beta therefore alpha. And notice that this is identical to the last argument form we saw, only the premise two and the conclusion there are swapped around. So an instance of this argument form would be something like this. If you have water, then you have H2O, you have H2O, therefore you have water. Sounds legit, right? Interestingly, this is an invalid argument. Why is that? Well, let's, let's look at the truth table for this argument form. So remember, I've swapped the alpha and the beta. I've swapped the premise two there and the conclusion. The conditional should have all the same truth values because it's the exact same conditional that we had in the previous argument form. So now I'm looking for any lines where I have true premises and a false conclusion. And yes, indeed, on row three, since I've switched the premise and the conclusion, I do have all true premises and a false conclusion. And again, remember, this is invalid star. It's an argument form, not an argument. So what did we mean by that? Well, it's different than the valid star. Remember in, in the last argument form that we just saw, we said that valid star means that you know, any argument you make that, that shares that argument form, that's an instance of that argument form, is going to be a valid argument. Not necessarily the same for an invalid star argument form. So why what that means, what that entails, we'll look at in just a second here. But why would it be the case that that first argument instance of the argument form uh, that 
if you have water, then you have H2O, you have H2O, therefore you have water. That seemed pretty legit, right? Why was that an invalid argument? First, just looking at the W's and H's and, and substituting them in here for this alphas and betas. Notice that we have the exact same truth table, only you know with different letters. So row three still stands here. That's still a potential uh, row for our argument uh, about W's and H's. Why did it seem so convincing? Well, uh, there are a couple of reasons why that is. First of all, notice that what we're not saying, we're not saying by it's an invalid argument to say, therefore, you have water. We're not saying that it's a valid argument to say, therefore, you do not have water, right? Uh, really, like the, this is an invalid argument form because you can't uh, conclude one way or another what you have. Now, notice that that if you have W, then you have H is not the same thing as saying if you have H, then you have W. Those are two different conditionals. So claiming that having H entails that you have W because of that if W then H, well, that's not necessarily the case. Now, we happen to know that it is the case. I happen to know that water is identical to H2O, so that if somebody were to say this, they would probably know that, right? And um, because of that, I sort of fill in that if H, then W as well. I, I sort of make this a W if and only if H. In other words, I make the conditional go both ways in my mind. So I'm kind of surprised when you say, whoa, whoa that's an invalid argument. No, but no, the two things are identical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if W, then H, that proposition right there is not the claim that W if and only if H. So in other words, I kind of uh, mentally fill in details there, and that's why it seems like such an attractive argument form. So yeah, this is a, a, an invalid star argument form overall, and now we see that you know it can be enticing, it can be uh, uh, kind of, it can be tricky, um, but if an argument shares this argument form, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a valid argument. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's invalid either. So take for example the argument. If you have water, then you have water. You have water, therefore you have water. Now, interestingly enough, this is also an instance of this argument form, affirming the consequent. Um, and how is that possible? Because remember, our well-formed formula variables can actually stand for the same well-formed formula. So in this case, alpha and beta are both being replaced by that W. Now, this is a valid argument, but it's not valid because it's an instance of this argument form. It's valid because it's an instance of a different argument form as well. It's an instance of the argument form, if alpha, then alpha, alpha, therefore alpha. That is a valid argument form. I don't know why you would make that argument, but it's a valid argument form, right? It follows. And because it's an instance of both of those, and at least one of them is a valid star argument form, it will be a valid argument. So yeah, we can't conclude just because uh, it, uh, an argument is an instance of this affirming the consequent that it is a, a valid, an invalid argument. But I should say, however, that since this argument form is so enticing, people will at times make the uh, the mistake of thinking that it's a valid argument when it sh because it shares this argument form. So when they make that, that error, we call that affirming the consequent. So that's what this argument form is. Let's look at the next argument form called modus tollens, and it's an argument form that looks something like this. If alpha, then beta, not beta, therefore not alpha. And uh, an instance of this argument form would, would be something like this. If the Clippers win the NBA championship, then I'm the Queen of England. I'm not the Queen of England, so the Clippers will not win the NBA championship. I actually wrote this several weeks before uh, the NBA Finals, and uh, it was sweet, sweet glory when the Lakers won. But in any case, um, this is a valid argument, and let's look at the truth table to see why that is. Again, we're going to have the same conditional for premise one, so our truth table will just look identical in that spot. For premise two, this is actually going to look the same as um, the premise two from the previous argument, affirming the consequent, except for now we're denying it. So we're switching all the T's and F's. And the same thing for the conclusion, just switching all the T's and F's. And now when we look and try to find a row where we have true premises and a false conclusion, we see that we don't have anything like that. So this is, again, valid star argument 
form, that means that any argument that you make of this form will also be a valid argument. And remember, you can also substitute in, you know, any any length of well-formed formula into these well-formed formula variables. So I, I could have changed it to, you know, if the Clippers or the Bucks or the Heat, I'm not, I, dude, I actually have a lot of respect for the Heat and uh, the Nuggets. Oh, so such a, an amazing couple of teams that are uh, so scrappy. So my hat's off to you guys. Yeah, you had me sweating, man. Anyway, so I could have put all those things, A or B or C or D, then, you know, uh, what would it be? If, if C, then Q, right? Then Q, not Q. Therefore, it's also not the case that A or B or C or D, et cetera, et cetera. So I can make these, uh, the alpha or the beta, any size uh, well-formed formula that I want, and I'm going to get a valid argument because it's an instance of this valid star argument form. So that's that's it, modus tollens. I actually already talked about this argument form, by the way, at the very first video in this playlist. I think it was like uh, why you want to do this class or uh, something like that. The introduction to the introduction. I can't remember what I ended up calling it, but the very first video in this whole playlist, like at the very before I even got into the book, uh, I talked about one. Uh, one tricky instance. So the modus tollens actually ends up being a, a, a little bit, a uh, little bit spicy, a little bit confusing. And an experiment was done on uh, college students, not not the you know dissection kind of experiment, but like a social experiment where they were asked a question that was basically modus tollens. Like they were given a bunch of, of cards and, and asked this question. Um, that was set up like a modus tollens. Well, I, I don't want to get too far into it just because, you know, you can look at the video if you'd like to to see that example. But interestingly enough, like some over 80 percent of, of students got it wrong. They thought that that this was not a valid way of arguing. And uh, this includes students that have taken logic courses. They just didn't pick up, pick up on it. And when I read the study, I actually almost made the mistake myself. But I mean, I teach logic. So I, I had to sit there and think, wait, wait a second. This is a modus tollens. You know, it was it was weird. But interestingly, and this is something I don't mention in that video, um, that ha that tends to happen when you are doing abstract things like computer programming or or just evaluating some bizarre rules. But when you're talking about things with practical consequences, uh, it seems like our, our brains just sort of, you know, switch over and totally get it. Uh, so a, an additional experiment was done later. And you could kind of just to get the gist of it, uh, imagine, you know, in the United States, the legal drinking age is 21 or over. So let's say I'm a police officer and I go into uh, my local pub and I see uh, a kid I know is 16 and a kid I know is 21. Now, the rule is if you have an alcoholic beverage, then you must be 21 or over. So the question is, whom do I have to check their cups for? You know, who, who, who do I have to see like what you're holding in your hand? What, what is it that they're drinking? It seems obvious I have to check the 16 year old. But think about that. That's a modus tollens argument. If 21 or over, uh, sorry, no, it would go if alcoholic beverage, then 21 or over, not 21 or over. Therefore, it better not be the case that alcoholic beverage. Right. So it's totally weird. It totally makes sense. And yet when we see it in an abstract setting, it's so hard to understand. Whereas the modus ponens, everybody gets uh, that. That seems like the most obvious one. OK, in any case, let's go on to the fourth argument form that we'll talk about, which is denying the antecedent. And again, it's going to look uh, very similar to modus tollens, but it's going to be an invalid star argument form. So it's if alpha, then beta, not alpha, therefore not beta. And again, like our modus ponens and uh, affirming the consequent arguments, I'm doing the exact same thing I just did with modus tollens, only swapping the second premise and the conclusion. And now I see in row three, that we have true premises and a false conclusion. So this is an invalid star argument form. Now, why is it that the one argument form is valid star and the other one is invalid? So I'm just going to start saying valid and invalid because now that you understand the, the, the idea here, you know, there's no reason to really keep adding the word star in there. So why is it that one of them is valid and the other one is invalid? Well, if you think about it, here's the statement. If you have alpha, you must have beta. Right now, let's say I deny that you have beta. So this is modus tollens. I say we don't have beta, by the way. 
Well, think about that. If I had alpha, I would have to have beta. That means if I don't have beta, but I do have alpha, I have a problem, right? I just said if you had alpha, you had to have beta, right? So if I have a beta, and if I don't have beta, I can't have alpha. That's modus tollens. If I have alpha, then I must have beta. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, alpha is the only way to get beta necessarily, right? That doesn't mean that you uh, can't have beta without having alpha. That would be, say, if beta, then alpha. That Then we would have that be the case. So just because I don't have alpha doesn't mean that I can't have beta. That's not what that premise says. That premise is only saying if you have alpha, you got to have beta. So this one is an invalid argument. And an instance of that that is tricky, let, I'm going to give you one that... that um, does that would be uh, easy to confuse in computer programming? I find like it's always uh, when you when you first start learning computer programming, uh, you make these mistakes all the time because uh, you tell the computer what to do in certain cases, and you assume that the computer is going to know what you you want it to do when those conditions don't obtain. So, for example, let's say you're programming a video game and you have your little character and you tell the computer when my character if my character uh, gets the energy pellets, then my character continues to live. Uh, now, what's going to happen if this character misses the energy pellets? Well, uh, if you were to look at this like as conversationally, like I had told somebody that, like, let's say I was your boss and I told you, hey, what I want it to be the case is that, you know, if the character gets the energy pellet, then he continues to live. And uh, and you're programming that I'm going to assume that, you know, what I'm that I mean, if you don't get the energy pellet, then you don't continue to survive because that's obviously as you know, for us humans, like that's that's one of the goals that we know that of the game is, is to survive. But the computer doesn't know that. So all you've told the computer to, to do is what it do, what it should do if it gets the pellet. You haven't told it what to do if it doesn't get the pellet. So likely your your character is just going to keep on surviving. It's going to keep on going because you know it hasn't picked up on the fact that you want it to die or not survive if you do not get the pellet. Right. So that that would be the, the invalid argument. Um, if pellet F, if P, then S survive, not P, therefore not S is an invalid argument. And the computer's not going to do that. Your guy's just going to keep going on and you're going to be frustrated and tears will come into your eye. And I know this because I took computer science in the Air Force Academy and oh, it was brutal, but uh, I survived. I persevered. In any case, these four argument forms, hopefully you see how they're kind of related to each other. They're not the only ways that you can get uh, a conclusion from uh, a conditional statement. And the next time we're going to talk about hypothetical syllogisms. Uh, but these are probably the most uh, common argument forms that you'll find using a conditional. And, and they're probably the most interesting insofar as you'll see these like even in Excel spreadsheets that that you might be doing that they're easy to confuse you. It's very easy to get things wrong because modus tollens and uh, denying the consequence or denying the antecedent are, are very tricky ones. But in any case, that is all for this. If you have more questions on on these, because these are uh, very tricky argument forms and they're deceptively tricky because they look very uh, simple, but people get them wrong all the time. If you have any more questions on them, please hit me up in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. We'll talk about uh, hypothetical syllogisms. Adios. Adios.